name that heals, the name that saves, the name that delivers. No, the name given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Look at somebody telling you, glad you got the name. Amen. And when I was a kid, we grew up singing, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Any old timers remember that old song? He's more than just a story. He's the King of Glory. And you're dating yourself. You know that? They say that means Liverpool. Amen. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Y'all looking at me like a cow in a new game. I'm glad I know who Jesus is.
they are there representing all of us. Uh, this godly couple that led the apostolic movement for so many years, and uh, their their music, their preaching ministry, a tremendous pastor. And what's amazing is now, Brother Jimmy Shoemaker, many years ago when he was a young man, uh, pastored a church in Miami, Oklahoma, which is not near the water at all. But a little small town when he was a young man, Sister Bobby Shoemaker was a young uh, preacher's wife that pastored there. And as all the years have gone by, he became the bishop and in somewhat of a retired state, except for going out and teaching and preaching. And can you believe it? That church was without a pastor. And they called Brother and Sister Shoemaker. They said, could you come back and fill in for a little while? We need a pastor. And in their, in their late 80s, went back to Miami, Oklahoma, and it's an amazing thing. Guess what happened? They started having a revival. Hey, you're not too old to be used of God. It's really, it's an amazing story what God has done. And uh, they're strong in their health and sharp as they've ever been. And God is blessing them. And tonight is a big celebration honoring their birthday and ministry. So uh, Bishop Young and Bishop Wilson are there. My wife is with them, my mom. And uh, so uh, we hope they have a wonderful time. So you're stuck with old me tonight. So, but it's going to be good. Look, somebody say, he's going to preach good tonight. Let's make a deal. Brother Boston, you're the only one that will feel obligated to do this. If I am not done at 8.30, you stand up and say this best. <laughs> Y'all like that? All right. It's going to be your favorite sermon of the week. Man, I feel good tonight. I like being with the people of God. Hey, my best day in the world doesn't even come close to my worst day.
probably my favorite <laughs> New Testament character other than God in the flesh. Uh, but honestly, sometimes it's hard for me to relate to Jesus because he's God. But I can identify with, with the Apostle Peter because I, I can see me saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing. And at times I can get great revelation and the next moment I can be get behind me saying, anybody, anybody ever feel kind of like that the way your life is sometimes? It's kind of like Matilda. When you're good, you're really good. When you're bad, you're really bad. And uh, uh, that, that's kind of maybe why I can relate. I, I like Old Testament. My favorite character is, is David. The New Testament, Peter, I, I seem to identify with him. Uh, and, and I love, I love to read the writings of Peter uh, because of that identity. And we, we, we've had a front row seat as we have looked at his life. And it's, it's, as if, it's as if God has revealed the struggles of his life for our benefit. And uh, I, I can't wait. Well, I'm not planning to leave today, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to enjoy talking with, with the Apostle Peter because I, I've, got a, I've got a lot of questions I want to ask him. And, uh, but one of, the, one of the things that I, you hear me refer to it often, is that he was the guy that had the keys to the kingdom. And, and I love that, that it's keys plural. It's not one key. And so that means when I look at his words that he penned or preached to uh, us, I I'm learning that he's giving us very important information. And that there are things that the Apostle Peter would open that looks like the other apostles and disciples did not even have the keys, but he was the one that would give these revelations and understandings that we can glean from. So, so tonight I, I see some things that I want to show you some other keys on the key ring here today. One of the things he wants us to understand is he said we have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't ever let modern society rob you of your belief that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Well, I thought I'd get a little better response than that. You young people, I don't care what your professor says. I don't care what your compromising theologian says. Understand something. If there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ, we may as well close all the doors and give up on any kind of faith. It all hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if any of you young people, Brother Adam King, stand up back there. If any of you got any questions dealing with a college professor, go see that man right there. He spent an entire night teaching us a few months back about how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than, than, than there is that Shakespeare lived. Go talk to him. That guy's educated. He, he studied. He's debated and argued with the best of them. He's an apologist. Go talk to him. Why? It's very important. And understand something. Because he lives, Brother Wayne Scott, I can live also. So no matter what I'm going through, guys, no matter what I'm facing, no matter what looks like, everything's going wrong, I still have a blessed hope that because Jesus Christ rose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, I live
salvation. There was the initial saving from sin. Then there is the continuing work of salvation getting me through. But I'm not yet completely saved until I make heaven my home and I am saved eternally. So I, I had a past experience of salvation and now I'm being saved in the present through the work of sanctification. But it's to keep me. That's why the Bible says we got all these different salvation scriptures. And the last one says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. So much for that eternal salvation life. You gotta stay in the game. You gotta, you gotta have that initial salvation. Then you endure through all the trials and temptation. And you endure to the end until you make heaven your home. And so this is what the work of sanctification is. How many remember when you got saved, there were still issues in your life? You had to have a preacher. You had to have the word of God. You had to have spirit life. You had to have discipleship. You had to have Bible studies. Why? Because the work of sanctification. So some of you came in, you came from the most busted up life and messed up life. You didn't have anything together. And then you got the Holy Ghost and things begin to happen. And order began to come in your life. That was the work of sanctification. Amen. And notice what he, he says that it is unto obedience. So this work, this election that we are brought into, into this relationship with Jesus. Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's purifying us. It's bringing us into conformity to the will of God. And it is unto obedience. So everything, don't miss this. This is, this is overlooked. We make it harder than it is. Everything about the Holy Ghost in your life is about obedience. Everything that happens in this book, in our prayer, in our devotion, in our faith life, or as we call it, discipleship, our spirit life, it's all to move us to live and walk into conformity to the will and word of God. So, you, you want to know about living for God, it all comes down to obedience. Now he says to the elect, he says in verse number six, he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Some of you may be hearing you're in, you're in a season right now of difficulty, trials. The word here in the King James is, is temptation, but it's, it's literally means trials. Where things are just overwhelming. Maybe it's, maybe it's chronic illness. Maybe it's chronic pain. Maybe it's a financial season that you're in that you can't seem to get out of. Or, or maybe you're in a fight for your very survival. And that, that, that's buffeting you. It's not easy. It's not fun. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to talk about behind a, a, a fancy pulpit with a bunch of people. But life gets hard sometimes. And then adding to life is the buffeting that comes in a season. But let me, let me point something out. It's a season. And at some point, the season will change if you are in Christ. You may be going through the pressure cooker. You may be going through the, the hardest trial of your life. But it didn't come to stay. It's only a season. It's going to come to pass. So I came to give you a little bit of hope today, a little faith. Stir up the gift that is in you and say, God, I know that this is a season. And I may be crying right now, but your Bible says that there's a time to cry. If you just keep walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you get to the mountaintop, just keep walking. Don't die in your depression. Don't die in that low time. Don't die in that thing that's going on. Keep walking by faith. Amen. Amen. These trials, the word of God, Peter says, are the means of you being rewarded. He said that the trial of your faith be much more precious, verse 7, than a gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whatever you're dealing with today, if you will just keep on enduring, there is a promise of praise and honor and glory. And he said, an ultimate bit, uh, ultimate ending is your own personal salvation. And I got a feeling that when we step over those streets of gold, whatever the biggest fight or issue we have, man, I'm excited. I got a 
But I got a feeling when we step onto that, what's it going to be like to be that first gentleman? Yes, Lord. Have you ever walked on? I mean, think about how rich that place is. The streets are paved with gold. What else is up there? I mean, if that's the, if that's the silk, I mean, think about the size of the oyster that made the gate out of pearl. Maybe it's our own trials irritate. I, 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 I can have a lot of that. But, but I, just, I just know that whatever I go through down here is going to be over, done, gone, and not even a blip on the radar. And then here's an incredible thing, going down to verse number 12. Unto whom it was revealed, talking about these Old Testament, that not unto them themselves, but unto us. They did, speaking of the Old Testament prophets, they did minister things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which thing the angels desire. So he said, all those great Old Testament prophets, they never even saw this. As great as Isaiah was, as great as the was, as great as Jeremiah. Because if y'all think I'm going to let him stand up and say he dismissed, I'm going to finish before he gets a chance to do it. Because all you, y'all won't remember the sermon. All you'll remember is, you remember the night Boston shut his daddy down. But how? Whatever. 
head and say, God, you're going. Boy, that is where the biggest battle is. That's where all the junk happens right there. He says, guard your mind. Um, I said for the precious family in this church over the, over the last few days that are, they're going through a struggle. They're in a season. They're in a, in a, in a tough place right now. And I wish I could wave a magic wand and fix it. But it's their season. But I told them, you have to remind yourself when you're in those seasons, His grace is sufficient. So if you're in one of those seasons, here's how you pray. God, give me grace. Grace is more than the unmerited favor of God. The, the evangelical moment, Protestantism, has just cheapened grace. The unmerited favor of God. We know that. But grace is so much bigger than that. Grace is that thing that carries me through some of the most difficult times of my life. Seven minutes. The biggest battle is in our mind. He says, so be sober. You need to be a clear thinker. Don't do stuff that's going to mess with your mind. That's why I don't have a television on. Are you feast on that junk? Be careful what you're, what you're logging into and clicking into because it's going to affect your spirit. What you listen to. What you read. Who you listen to. Guard your mind. Don't run with ignorant people. Ignorant rubs off. <laughs> Brother Zach Wells, daddy, he's dead and gone. He said, stupid just survived. Second Thessalonians 2 and 2, be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He said, in other words, the biggest thing's going to be right here. And your mind's going to mess with you. He called them, he said, be holy, because he is holy. Understand something. Isaiah 55, verse 89 is, is one of the very powerful verses. Uh, did I give you that one? I give you that one. But, but in there, he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Have you noticed everybody's got a thought? So they go get a Twitter account. For the sheer joy of sharing their thoughts. And everybody's got a thought. But God said, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. So be careful before you start taking in thoughts. Of other people's thoughts. Because you're going to wind up adding their messed up thoughts with your messed up thoughts. And we are so far beneath his thoughts. So what I've got to do, especially when I'm going through a season of trials, stay off of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all that junk and get back to the Word of God and say, all right, God, I'm going to find out what your ways are. I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to lean not on my own understanding. I'm making this up as I go. This ain't in my notes. I got four minutes to get across. 
So you got a mechanic in the church, and somebody's car breaks down, and they're a new convert. And somebody else in the church says, oh, you need to see Brother So-and-so, he's a mechanic. So they're a new convert, they go to the mechanic, and the mechanic in the church says, oh, I can do that, and it's going to be such and such, and then they don't do it, or they, or they break it or do something worse, and then what happens? Somebody, and I'll see you Sunday. 